the next time that I can really recall being aware of them was in elementary school, maybe around fifth grade. I noticed I just kept uh, moving my head, neck, hands, arms, shoulders. And when I, when I would try to describe why I was doing it, uh, it was a sensation of almost spider webs. Welcome to the Secret Life Podcast. Tell me your secret. I'll tell you mine. When I first started my recovery 11 years ago, I struggled through the textbook-like material on the subject. I wanted to make the addiction and the recovery from it accessible and relatable to more people by telling it in an entertaining way. Well, I'm super excited to announce I've released my first book, Secret Life of a Hollywood Sex and Love Addict. If I can help just one person find a solution or at least realize they're not broken or alone, then writing this has been worth it. You can buy my book or audiobook directly from my site, secretlifenovel.com, or worldwide at every major retailer. May is Mental Health Awareness Month, and we partnered up with Ignited by Dr. Adi Jaffe to support mental health and those struggling with addiction. As you probably know, Mark and My Recovery is 12-step based but we also know that it's not for everyone. Many of our guests have recovered from addiction through other programs and systems. This week, you can enroll in the Ignited Hero Program for free. With 14 days of free access to the Hero Program, you and your loved ones can kickstart your journey to breaking free from addictions, habits, and compulsions that no longer serve you. Check out the link in the episode notes and sign up for free. Now enjoy the show. Welcome to Secret Life Podcast. I'm Brianne davis Gant. Today, I'm pulling back the curtains of all kinds of human secrets. We'll hear about what people are hiding from themselves or others. You know, those deep, dark secrets that they probably want to go to their grave with, or those lighter, funnier secrets that are just plain embarrassing. Really, the how, what, when, where, and why of it all. Today, my guest is Jack. Jack, I have a question for you. Dun, dun, dun. What is your secret? Well, my secret is that I have a tick. Oh, really? Now, I don't know what the medical name for it is, really, uh, because I haven't really researched it or anything, but I have a, a series of different sorts of ticks. And the reason why it's a, a little bit bigger of a deal for me is that I'm a TV and film actor. So, what are the ticks that you have? Well, um, is it okay if I take you back to sort of the beginning when please. I first discovered it? Yes, Well, please. My, some of my very first memories are of ticks, and that was that I recall there was um, a thing I would do where I would just sort of, well, my parents called it tug at my penis, but that wasn't really what was happening. I would just sort of uh, pick it, and uh, later on, I, I'll, I can explain what was happening there. And they would say, you know, stop playing with yourself is what they would say. I was four. Right. And the other thing I, that came at around the exact same time was I would snort like a pig. It sounded like this. <laughs> and my parents would say, stop, stop snorting like a pig. And um, those are some of my earliest memories. And then later, the next time that I can really recall being aware of them was in elementary school, maybe around fifth grade. I noticed I just kept uh, moving my head, neck, hands, arms, shoulders. And when I when I would try to describe why I was doing it, uh, it was a sensation of almost spider webs. In other words, I would since I'd, I'd feel a sensation of like spider webs, although not literally. It's not like I thought there were actual spider webs. It's just right. the closest way I can describe why I was doing what I was doing um, under my neck, for instance. So if I felt this sensation under my neck, this deep desire to move my neck, to rid myself of this feeling, it would look like I would point my chin up to the ceiling and stretch my neck. Uh, same thing with my elbows, uh, the space between my thumb and the rest of my fingers. Um, anyway, it caused a lot of unnecessary movement. Then, you know, I started to go into acting and, 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 and in college, um, I was still doing it and I was started to feel great shame and embarrassment. Mm. And right. when I would see other people do it, I would feel uh, embarrassed for them and ashamed of it. And then uh, I moved to Los Angeles and started working. And it was just constant anxiety on set uh, as to not wanting people on set to know 
um, really forcing myself to, to keep myself from doing it once the camera's rolling. And, you know, they start the camera rolling and, and there's, you know, maybe a minute before you act sometimes before the director says action. And that was a right. particularly stressful time because I knew I probably wouldn't tick while I was acting in that space right before he says action, I had a lot of anxiety, you know, and the anxiety made, made it worse. So it, did you notice that these things happen when you're overly anxious? They come well, out? I do think that they are triggered by anxiety, yes. And I was a very anxious person and spent, you know, 15 years studying self-help and new age thoughts and mm-hmm. Marian Williamson. And I really have healed myself of my addiction to negative thinking. And that's really made the ticks uh, much, much less. However, I'm sure I still do them, especially, you know, like when a plane's going to take off. And sometimes if I'm just, uh, well, whatever, they come up, they come up. But I do, I do want to go back for a second because you I, you described a sensation of spider webs in your neck. What, like the, what is that sensation? Like, like a tickly, you know, when you walk through spider webs, no, that it not like at tickles? All. Not at all. No, okay. um, nothing like that. And it's not in my neck, but it would be considered outside my neck uh, in the space between my chin and my Adam's apple. It's as if, how do I explain that? Gosh, I mean, it's, it's not the literal sensation of spider webs. It's just this desire, the kind of desire you'd have to get rid of that web, but it's not because of the way it feels. And you know, I, it's a hard thing to describe, but here's something interesting. What I learned was the way to stop moving my body so much, and I, I, I learned this in, let's say, maybe ninth grade, I realized instead what I could do is touch that space, touch the space under my neck to get rid of the web so I wouldn't have to point my chin to the ceiling. Or instead of having to move my entire arm to alleviate the annoying feeling in my elbow, I would touch my elbow, scratch it hard. It's almost as if you're wiping away the spider web that way. I still do it to this day in the space between my thumb and my pointer finger as a way to not move my hand in a way that, uh, and, and the hand movements were so intense, this uh, um, tick in my hand that, I mean, mm-hmm. I used to be afraid I was going to give myself, um, what's that word when old people can't, um, can't move their hands well? Arthritis. Yeah, I was afraid I was going to give myself arthritis. So I began instead just tugging at the skin at the bottom of my thumb as a way that to not actually move the whole hand. And so your parents had saw this through y- your youth. Did they ever take you to the doctor? Or no. N- no. <laughs> no. They only reprimanded me and told me to stop that. Wow. And um, I didn't see it as a tick, really. I just saw it as this embarrassing thing I did, this embarrassing habit I had. Is, how, is, is what I thought of it for years and years and years and years. When I was young, a tick was Mel Tillis. Is that his name? Shit. There was an actor in the 70s who, when he would, blah, 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 he would say it's like, but then when he'd act, he was normal. But when he talked, he had a stutter. I thought that was what a tick was. So I didn't really know what my thing was, except something my parents hated seeing me do. I mean, they weren't cruel, but they, they always said, stop that. And again, so going back to my very first experience with it, which was grabbing at my penis, I, I, it, it's obvious to me now what it was is the, because I still get it sometimes, that spider web feeling on my, my, the, my penis was to sort of pull it away of whatever that is that I, I was feeling. Interesting. And, and have you ever talked about this to anybody else or gone? Uh, When I was in college, um, it's kind of interesting. My voice and speech teacher, he uh, actually had tics, quite a lot of them. And I was uh, back then still hadn't really um, wrapped wrapped my head around the fact that they weren't my fault. And so I just felt embarrassed for him the way I felt embarrassed for myself. And I remember one time I, I talked to him and the teacher said, you know, work with him on it. And I, I remember that one meeting, me and him sat down, he was an older gentleman, and he tried to help me, but I didn't find his advice helpful. And it's possible he had something different than I had. Right. Um, but my friends noticed that I have it. Uh, but, um, and uh, so do I talk to people about it? Uh, sure. But no, it's not something I, I, I lead with and... Do you want me to share with you how I got 
past the negative feelings around it. Yes, I do. I do. I, but I do, before we get to that, I do want like to, any of these secrets that we hide that were shameful for us internally, I always like to attach the seven deadly sins, not in the religious sense, but more in the character defect human sense. So here they are. And do any of these attach to this shameful secret you've been holding? (laughs) He's smiling. Um, We have pride, greed, lust, gluttony, envy, anger, and sloth. Well, sure. Um, I guess pride and envy a little bit in terms of why, uh, how I hold, held on to the punishing myself I was doing around the concept of my tics. So pride would be not wanting to feel different uh, and wanting to fit in. And uh, envy would be wishing I didn't have this and therefore not certainly not sharing it with anyone and feeling like it was a dirty or ugly secret. I mean, I get it. I felt the same way with my dyslexia. I, as an actor too, I hate going on set and not knowing that how to say the name of a character and I have to spell it different. And I'm so shameful when I would hold the side so no one can see how I spell oh. <laughs> like couch or a word completely different. Yeah, I didn't oh. know how to spell couch for the longest time because of my dyslexia and this shame like sat inside of me. So I totally get hiding that as a child and, you know, seeing your parents be like, why can't you learn the alphabet? You know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, we, we take our cue from our parents and, uh, you know, as I said, my earliest memories were my parents saying, stop snorting, like literally my first memories. And, and they never looked into why wow. ever. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm very, I would love to ask them why they didn't want to find out you were doing it. Have you ever spoke to them about it? Uh, not about why they didn't talk to me about what what was causing it. I haven't, but you know, I'm from a I'm I'm a, from a different generation when your parents, you know, kids were to be igno- sort of ignored until dinner time. You know, it's like it's not it wasn't a, a time of self. Uh, it, what is that word? Self reflection. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Now, I do want to get into how you got through it and what you do, um, but who do you think keeping this secret has benefited and who do you think it's harmed? Benefited and harmed. Well, I mean, the thing is, the secret is such a personal thing. It, it's not acting out on anyone. So mm-hmm. there's no, only going to be one answer. And I suppose uh, me a little bit for both um, because, as you know, As an actor, I would suppose an executive would always find a reason not to hire you because the executive's jobs are to keep their job, uh, not to create great art. (laughs) So, um, you know, I suppose not putting it on my resume might have been a good idea to protect myself. (laughs) But again, it's not like I knew I I never do it when I'm acting. Um, Anyway, and then as far as that's that's protecting, and then you said hurting. Mm -hmm. Well, I certainly hurt myself for years uh, because I didn't finally uh, heal myself from it until I finally um, saw a therapist. And I, I think every Every kid in high school should be forced to see a therapist, which should be introduced at a young age. I agree. I agree. And uh, I'm so happy that 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 um, my friend convinced me when I turned 30, uh, which is a time where a lot of people are facing a big change in their life to see a therapist. And she helped me a lot. And then I I went back when I turned 40. And and, and, uh, it's important, I think, to check in with a therapist because there are things you need to talk out and there are things you need mirrored back to yourself in order to give yourself better understanding of who you are and where you are. Do you remember what this therapist, like how she helped you move through it? Can you? Oh my God, I'll never forget. It was one sentence and I was healed. I have never heard that. That is a shocker. You tell me that sentence. Well, like now I kind of want to hear you guess. Oh God, no. <laughs> Fix that in one sentence, Brianne. Go try again. Oh my God, no. That's so much pressure. <laughs> okay, so it was so simple. She said to me, have you ever considered that maybe you have a sort of low case of Tourette's? And it was like the clouds parted and the sun came through. Oh. Because for the very first time, I considered the fact that it wasn't my fault. Wow, yeah. And it made absolute sense to me. I thought, yes, that is exactly what this feels like, completely out of my control, not an intense sensation, but a sort of low-grade 
low, a low grade uh, affliction of a Tourette's like um, issue. And, and, and therefore it was never, I mean, I was born with it. It yeah. was never my fault. So clearly the issue was, and the shame came from me thinking it was, quote, my fault. And at the moment she said that, I had no problem with the fact I do it. I would, now, I would now begin to just openly share the fact that I have tics with people with no shame. And when I see people with tics, I, I don't feel shame for them. I just feel a sort of, of brotherhood with them. Wow. That just moved me so much because the moment I remember my therapist telling me about my disease and what I've been carrying around, it also gave me this like, <gasps> like I'm not broken. Like there's nothing not wrong with me. Yes. Yeah. Yes, the exact same feeling. <laughs> yeah. And I find I do it so much less now. Well, part of that, as I said, may be the fact that I overcame my addiction to anxiety. I had been studying self-help and the concept that, that we all have an ego on our shoulder uh, that, that I was trained to, to sort of see as a vulture. Mm -hmm. That is the half of me that wants me to fail and he says terrible things to me all day. And uh, the idea is that you can learn to control your thoughts, to refocus your thoughts, and that's how you rid yourself of anxiety, by talking to your vulture and letting it know, I'm not interested in what you're saying. I don't want to talk to you, vulture, about the fact that I'm a loser or I'm no good, right? Yeah. So anyway, I'm at a party, and um, there's a psychic there. And uh -huh. the psychic is talking to my friend, and the psychic says this concept. She says... I release and destroy my need for that. And to me, that gave me the language to speak to my vulture in. Because the problem with how a lot of people teach you know, affirmations is they tell us to tell our vulture, I am a beautiful, gorgeous <laughs> um, you know, child of humanity. I am a success. And then you get into things like the secret. And I personally don't think they work that well. But if your vulture is saying you need to be perfect, you just say to your vulture, okay, look, I want to be perfect, fine, but I don't need to be. I release and destroy my need to be perfect. And then your vulture goes, yeah, but you need, wait, what? And your vulture shuts up about whatever concept it's saying to you to make you feel anxiety. So I teach that because I teach acting and I teach it to actors. It's the most important thing to learn as an actor is to get rid of your anxiety or your blocks and issues around doing your art. And so that has, I have completely trained my vulture. And so I just don't have any anxiety on set the way I used to. Oh my God. I have to tell you, that's the first, the, I got your book because you give it free. And I remember yeah. before I, before I booked a series that I, someone said, oh, you should read his book. It was a friend of a friend that we know. And when I read that, when because when I you go in and test for a series, yeah. it's so much pressure, right? And you already signed the contract and you're in the room with like three other, two other, you know, people up for the part. And I remember reading your, that little section and it yeah. really helped me. Oh, I'm glad. Yeah. I remember exactly reading about the vulture and I was like, it really helped me like just kind of be. Yeah. I release and destroy my need to book this job. I want to, but I don't know what's best for me. I could book this job and miss out on the opportunity I was meant to get. Exactly. Or I could die on set. You know, it's about understanding that we don't know what's best for us and that our vulture tries to convince us that we do. Yeah. Oh, I love to hear that. I'm glad that you're using them. Yeah. The, can I share that with people what that where that book is? Yeah, go ahead, please. Yes, share. Oh, okay. Well, it's on my website. It's a free ebook I wrote for actors, but you don't have to be an actor to enjoy the first third of the book, which is really all just about um, controlling your thoughts and focusing on love. And uh, my website is jackplotnik.com. Uh, and you would just go, you click on the word teacher and that takes you to my free book. Oh, it's amazing. Honestly, I got so much. I think I highlighted it too. And I, I used to bring some of the pages on, on with me in my set, like on the back script. So please go get the book and it's free, which is crazy. It shouldn't be free. Oh, that's so sweet. I, you know, I, uh, that same therapist who healed me on this issue, mm -hmm. I was talking to her about how I so wanted to do something to help people to feel good about who I am on, on this planet. And then I said, but I don't want to hold a dying person's hand. Mm. And she says to me, is that the only way to help people? 
And I went, oh my God, you're right. Like, I don't know why it helped me to understand, do what you want to do, what you can do, what's right for you. And I realized that because I had overcome my addiction to anxiety and had applied it to my acting, that I had something to share with actors that would make acting fun and easy. And when it's fun and easy, you always book more. And yeah. so I wrote that book and uh, I do monthly charity lectures. And right now I'm teaching online all, all for charity for right now for Stacey Abrams Fair Fight 2020, which helps with the, to create um, election uh, fairness. So anyway, yeah, I, I highly recommend thinking about, well, what do you, what, what could you do to feel good? That's, and, and that's why I love what you're doing uh, with. This oh yeah. that's It's beautiful. Yeah. This is for fun and for free for me. I woke up yeah. one morning and I, and after, you know, writing the book and doing the Huff Post, it came to me, I was like secret life. I want to help other people g get through their secret or the person that doesn't have a voice to say what they're going through. Well, it's so powerful what you're doing. And that's why I'm so honored to be here because exactly, you know, you don't need, doesn't need to be your particular secret, just hearing other people's journeys with this. I mean, and it's such a beautiful addition to a kind of this sort of trend we're beginning to see where the world is, quote, you know, waking up. Yeah. And, and I think that what you're doing is priceless. Thank you. And I do have one more question before you go. If anybody's going through this feeling of like shame, like I talked about my dyslexia, you talked about your tics, like what would be the advice you would give them? Love yourself. Treat yourself with the love and acceptance you should have been treated with from the beginning, but that you may not have been because our parents aren't perfect. You're your parent now, mm -hmm. and you want to be a loving parent to your inner child. So do be aware that your inner child, or in other words, you back when you were four or five, back when you were blameless, lives in your heart. And uh, the way you talk to yourself is how you're treating your inner child. And uh, secondly, um, to see a therapist, uh, they are priceless. You know, obviously you want a good one. And I believe a good therapist listens and, and, is, and also is able to mirror back what they're hearing so that you can understand better your own thoughts about yourself. Oh, thank you so much for coming on, sharing your secret and your journey with us. Oh, thank you. I love being here. And if you want to be on the show, please email me at secretlifepodcast at iCloud.com. Until next time.